Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to The Free Frontier. I'm Bill Whittle. On July 20th of 1969, men from planet Earth first set foot upon the moon. They came in peace for all mankind, and they were Americans. You know, millions of us thought, and still hope, that the one small step was going to be simply the beginning of an endless age of exploration and not, as it is now appearing more and more likely, the high water mark of human history. Today, our National Space Agency has utterly lost its way. The era of the space shuttle has ended. NASA, supposedly the guardian of the world's most technologically advanced nation, can no longer put men into space and has no plans to do so for the foreseeable future. Actually, I take that back. They've got lots of plans, just none that they can build or afford. And after spending $10 billion of taxpayer money on the shuttle replacement program, the Constellation vehicles have been canceled, utterly scrapped, with nothing to show for it but a single, unmanned, suborbital test flight and a half-completed capsule with nothing to launch it on. So what happened? Well, government happened. Because Apollo, for all of its glory and miracles, and despite all of our pride and admiration, was a trap. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because to beat the big state, top-down, monolithic Soviet Union to the moon, we put into place a big state, top-down, monolithic government agency that long ago stopped being innovative and daring and has become instead just a standing army. It's a jobs program fed by government pork. You know, we're not really sure if there's life on other planets, but we are absolutely certain that representatives and senators are bringing home the space bacon. That's just how government works. The problem is that our current big government space program buys flight hardware on a cost-plus basis, simply reimbursing the contractors like Lockheed or Boeing for their expenses, that would be labor and materials, and adding a fixed profit. There's no incentive to stay on time or on budget and every incentive to drag their feet and run up the costs. So just what would a different program, a program driven by these uniquely American values, a genuinely American space program really look like? How would it be different? Well, first, because there would be competition, there would also be diversity. Many different companies with different designs, each providing a specific need. It would also mean that a failure in one launch system would not mean completely shutting down our access to space as happened for years after the Challenger and Columbia disasters. But the most important change would be to form a lean, mean, and focused NASA that looks more like the agency it was formed out of, the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, which did so much for civil aviation in the last century. It would be a NASA focused on pure research and technology development, on both robotic and human exploration of the moon and beyond, and no longer in the relatively mundane business of getting to and from Earth orbit, which we've been doing for half a century now. Get them back out in front of exploration and technology where they belong. It might surprise you to learn that right now, a truly American space program is already taking shape because a handful of private companies, private American companies, driven by bold vision, powered by innovation and careful risk-taking, and the sweat equity of perhaps a few hundred of the finest, most dedicated aerospace minds on the planet, are doing things right now that the entire governments of China or the European Union have been unable to do. Take John Carmack, lead programmer of the seminal computer games Doom and Quake, who has taken some of his millions of private dollars to form Armadillo Aerospace in Mesquite, Texas. They're building vertical takeoff and landing vehicles preparatory for the challenge of landing one of them on the moon. Or Bigelow Aerospace in Las Vegas, Nevada, formed by Robert Bigelow, a hotelier like my dad. He doesn't just dream about a hotel in space, he actually built one. Well, parts of one anyway. He actually launched them. They deployed and inflated not one but two of them in Earth orbit, and one of them is up there right this second as we speak, almost waiting for someone to come up and visit. And then, of course, there's Disneyland for the American private space program, Mojave, California. There, you can find mast and space systems who, like Armadillo, are perfecting vertical launch and landing systems that are so far advanced that they're able to shut down an engine in flight, relight the rocket in free fall, and have the vehicle return to stability just like a cat. What may be the best rocket engine built in the world today, the most efficient, reliable, and safe rocket engine on planet Earth, 
is being manufactured and tested just a few hundred yards away by my friends at Xcore Aerospace. Again, these are not computer renderings or hopes or promises. This is real world flying hardware that really and truly works. And Xcore itself is just a few doors down from the greatest aeronautical mind of the last 50 years at least. That'd be Bert Rutan, whose tightly run little shop called Scaled Composites did what only the entire populations of the United States, Russia, and China have managed to do, and that is put a man into outer space. On June 21st of 2004, an American citizen, a naturalized immigrant named Mike Melville, hand flew the Rutan Design Spaceship One into by God outer space. It was the first private space flight in human history. Since then, Sir Richard Branson, who, like Rutan and Bigelow and Carmack and all the others, is not afraid to put his money where his mouth is, has poured real resources into Burt Rutan's genius, and you, yes, you, can buy a suborbital ticket into outer space on Virgin Galactic right now, today. Meanwhile, of course, the government is bankrupt, and it will be for the rest of our lives. The space shuttle is now a thing of the past. We can't even get to our own $100 billion space station without hitching a ride from the Russians. As far as the government is concerned, America is grounded indefinitely, but the American government is not the same as the American people. Because just last year, PayPal founder Elon Musk and his company SpaceX flew their Falcon 9 rocket into Earth orbit on its first test flight. Now that is a remarkable piece of engineering. Just a few months later in December, their Dragon capsule rode a Falcon 9 into orbit, stayed up there for as long as they pleased, and splashed down right on target. As safe a flight as any Mercury or Gemini or Apollo mission costing tens or hundreds or even thousands of times as much. NASA's deal with SpaceX was the same kind of deal that you or I would make, a fixed price contract that incentivized fiscal discipline and on-time delivery. Did it make a difference? Well. For about $300 million of NASA's money, roughly a 30th of their cost plus constellation program, plus about $300 million of its own money, SpaceX delivered from scratch now two different fully functional launch vehicles, a new generation of engines, and a seven passenger pressurized capsule that flew a faultless first flight and which, had it been manned, would have returned its passengers to Earth without a scratch or even a scare. Now my friends, the space age did not peak on July 20th of 1969. The real space age, the sustainable space age, began on June 21st of 2004. Private enterprise works. It just works. It works in the neighborhood dry cleaning shops and it works with manned lunar vehicles. It cleans the clock of centralized state planning bureaucracies every time and every place it's been tried and it's working today, right now. If you're one of those people who, like me, remember seeing Neil Armstrong step off that ladder, and if you thought that your heart would just burst with pride and wonder, then at least consider the possibility that the spirit of adventure and courage and ingenuity that drove that miracle no longer lives in the government. But it didn't die. It's in the private sector where it belongs, and it needs your help. You have to help us blow on that spark call or write your congressman or woman and ask them just to look at what private space is doing. Ask them to compare what they do with what they spend. Because this decentralized, private, for-profit space age is only now beginning to dawn and nothing can stop it, nothing. Freedom and prosperity, competition and capitalism, courage, determination and genius unchained by the whims of politicians and bureaucracies. These are forces that simply cannot ever be defeated. America needs and deserves a space program as exceptional and independent as she herself is. And she's getting it too, whether Washington comes along for the ride or not.